Everything done here. Okay, are you guys ready? Sure. You gotta say, let's light this candle. Let's light this candle. <laughs> All right. I'm John Grace, and this is The Hammer Factor. I'm joined by my co-host, John Weld, a whitewater legend and owner of Immersion Research. Uh, welcome, John. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me uh, again. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks for coming on. <laughs> and as well, we have Lewis Geltman, water polo champion and policy counsel for the Outdoor <laughs> Alliance. Um, Lewis, how you doing? Oh, I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. It's, uh, it's good to talk to you guys. And uh, we got our celebrity guests lined up today, so um, that's exciting. And uh, there's kind of a lot to talk about. And this is, the way I see it, this is kind of going to be the, the Lewis Geltman show. Um, oh, man. In a way. Finally. Um, it's a lot of pressure. I don't know if I can carry more than well, a week into this conversation. First of all, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, we're up over 750 subscribers now, which is uh, exciting. So there's some people who appreciate our banter. I think we're getting a little better, uh, the three of us, as doing something that's uh, coherent in a way. Um, but let's let's get right into our viewer mail. We love our viewer mail. Always appreciate it. And all of our viewer mail basically was directed towards Lewis. We had a few that weren't. Um, but we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go right into some some viewer mail here that that went to Lewis. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of things that have been going on. There's been alternative Twitter handles. Um, there's been for all of the national park service places. There's been um, basically a, a freeze for people in the EPA, which I'm not sure. Is that a common practice? Has anybody ever heard of that? So we actually, somebody sent us this memo that it seems like has since gotten really widely leaked, but it was directed at the Department of Interior and it was about sort of their communications practices right now. And it was, uh, it was basically saying that the transition team needed to review any incoming correspondence from like national level environmental groups or recreation groups like specifically called out or industry or tribes or anyone basically and like we like saw this and like it seems like i don't know like pretty nefarious given everything else that's going on but uh it, it sounds like from what we hear that this is like actually I mean, maybe it's taken a little bit further, but there's some element of sort of standard practice to this when there's a transition between administrations, like they're just trying to make sure that they're kind of like up on everything that the, the agency is saying or, you know, it's coming in and out. So like, I, it's, I'm concerned about it, but I'm, my expectation is that it'll be like relatively short lived. But, you know, I think that the stuff, the anti-science stuff, the idea that, you know, the EPA can't talk about climate change anymore. I mean, that stuff is like way, way, way more concerning to me. So, I mean, I think that there's a lot to be extremely wary about, I guess. I, don't I mean, know. has has that ever happened before? Has anybody in your organization ever seen anything like that? Um, I mean, it's getting a little bit, you know, like the EPA stuff and the climate change stuff is like a little bit, outside of our wheel well like we work much more with the land management agencies on like public land stuff than on stuff that has to do you know like stuff that the epa handles which is more like pollution control like there's a bit of distinction there like i mean it's not to say that we don't care about this thing it's just like definitely we do and we'll weigh in on things like the you know the rules implementing the Clean Water Act and stuff like that, but I would say our organizational focus is much more on on public lands. So, you know, and the, again, climate change is like another one of those things that's like obviously it's a huge impact on all of us, but it's it's uh it's just such a big thing that I think that we don't want to let that pull too much away from our other areas of work, I guess. Um. So, like, I, I mean, I guess I recall, like, in the Bush administration, there were some, you know, some things that happened when, you know, political staff were reviewing the work of scientists and kind of changing, you know, the things that were meant to be, like, objective scientific conclusions. 
and it was a huge scandal, right? And like to, that these guys are now kind of just starting with that as like, this is going to be our paradigm for managing the work of scientists, like right out of the gate. I think that to me is a little more shocking, I guess. But I don't know. I'm kind of, I feel a little out of my depth on that one. Yeah. I've, I'm a little taken aback by it, but I'm, but at the same time, I want to keep an open mind. I'm like, is this something that happens when new administrations? Um... Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm not, you know, there are people out there who are like, oh, let's give these guys a chance. And again, I'm just speaking for myself here, not for OA, but, you know, I'm not in the, like, give these guys a chance school. I'm not in the, like, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But I do want to make sure that when we tell people the sky is falling, like the sky is falling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like when there are things that are happening that are, you know, medium bad or just normal, like let's talk about it, but let's make sure that we're not being alarmist because the time is going to come when it's going to be like all hands on deck for things that are legitimately really bad. And I, I don't want to like burn out everybody's outrage by, uh, being alarmist, you know? Yeah, yeah, you don't want to jump the gun. I I reached out to some people that I know that work in the EPA, and this is what I got. Um, no one could talk to me on record. I invited them to all come on the show and just give an inside perspective. But I, I did get that there is a uh, some things that they haven't seen before is that uh, they're reworking the website and basically hiding certain data that has been um, put on the website. This, they're, they're very concerned about that because the keys to all of the different websites where the data has been housed, it's been getting taken away. They're certainly uh, not allowed to talk to anybody. They think within 90 days that that will be lifted and the grants and things that they fund will be able to continue. Um, but they're definitely not sure what's gonna happen. <laughs> You know, so um, I don't know. It seem it seems crazy to me, but the whole thing is crazy to me. So I don't I, I don't know. It's cool you made those calls, man. You're like a real journalist. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't, don't give me don't give me too much credit. You know what I'm saying? He's like the Woodward and Bernstein of Whitewater. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, you see headlines and you read articles and. You're just like, wait a second, I just want to talk. I don't know about that. You know, I want to talk to somebody. And so that's what I tried to do. And I talked to four different people. And because uh, I know there's a lot of, and they pretty much all were like, I don't want to talk to you, John. <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> I can see you're like, Chelsea, wake up. <laughs> this goes all the way to the top. <laughs> Connect the dots. <laughs> just follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to our viewer mail. We got way off topic. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Lewis, but this one is directed towards you. Uh, this comes at us from Larry Boothby. Um, great show. I was thinking about Lewis dealing with the D.C. crowd in the congressional hearings. Um, I was wondering if the Outdoor Alliance – I got a 360 camera, Lewis. Can you take it in one of those meetings and record it? I don't know. Man, I'm going to give it to you next time you go up there. It would be killer to do that. <laughs> um, anyway, I was wondering if the Outdoor Alliance folks had ever thought about getting some of the policy ma policymakers out on the water. Um, Doug Woodward, in his book, Wherever Water Flows, talks about the battle to get wild and scenic status for the Chattooga. They were able to enlist the help of then-Governor Jimmy Carter. The way they did it was put him in a kayak and teach him to boat. It worked, and Carter became a huge advocate for the Chattooga River and the boating community. There is a photo in Woodward's book of Jimmy Carter in a long fiberglass kayak running bulls loose. Hmm. Um, Shit runner. Big. <laughs> I, heard that, I heard that Jimmy Carter had the first stand of bulls loose in a tandem canoe like in like a Grumman or something. <laughs> I don't know, but big hat tip to Larry Boothby. Thanks for the mail. Um, big hat tip to Jimmy Carter, man, running bulls loose <laughs> in a kayak. No, no joke. Come on. I, I, uh -huh. That's off the hook. He's, <laughs> Good people, man. You're right. <laughs> Um, yeah, he gave up his peanut farm because he thought it would be a conflict of interest. But we digress. Um, any thoughts in, in, in the Outdoor Alliance? Is, does any kind of thing like that ever get thrown around in your circles, Lewis? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a really good idea. Uh, we do do that. Uh, AW kills it on that front. Uh, I know 
uh, Tom O'Keefe and among others organized a meeting with uh, one of the staffers for Jamie Herr Butler, who's the congresswoman for White Salmon over the summer. And they like went out for a hike. They tried to get her out, but she was unavailable. But and uh, actually, Max Blackburn went out with those guys and met with her Butler staff and just kind of got to give those guys the rap about you know, the outdoor recreation economy and white salmon and how, you know, she might be inclined to think about national forests as something that, you know, produces timber or whatever. But, you know, these are places where, you know, there are guys like Russ showing up and starting film companies. There's guys like our buddy Yuri who are, you know, started a bakery and like all this kind of business and stuff is coming into town because, you know, basically it's like kayaking and because of windsurfing and mountain biking and, you know, helping those people connect the dots on that stuff and like really see what's going on and getting outside and doing something with, you know, people in Congress or staff is like super good idea. We, uh, we try and make that happen, especially our, you know, our member organizations, I think, are a little more active in that stuff than, than OA specifically, just because we're, you know, much smaller staff. But uh, I think that's a really good thought. And, you know, definitely folks out there putting that into action. So it's good. Yeah, it seems like an avenue for success. I mean, <laughs> but. it's like one of the things, you know, when we go to DC, it's like, people are so happy to talk to us compared to like so many other interests. It's like we show up at these meetings and we're like, you know, talking about awesome places and these congressmen's district and going outside and like doing cool things. And like, you know, the rest of their day is is, like people showing up to talk about like, like healthcare policy or something. You know, (laughs) it's like, I think we have something that's like fun and cool and it's good to, to capitalize on that. Yeah. Well, Big shout out to – we love our viewer mail. It's always fun to uh, see what people – you know, what, what, what's spinning in their head. And, uh, well, you're awful quiet today. I'm just taking it all in. Yeah. I, I just think the politics going on right now are, are riveting. I can't, I can't get enough of it. Really. You seem riveted. What's that? I said you seem like you're riveted. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys, you know, you, the viewers can't see this, but John, you look like you're like broadcasting from an igloo, man. You got a sock hat on, a, <laughs> a hooded sweater, a giant down jacket. Well, times are tough here at I already shut off the heat. <laughs> no, to get peace and quiet here, I have to go upstairs to this office that's that's not really heated. I put a space heater in here like a couple hours before we start, uh-huh. but it's still probably mid forties here. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we uh, move on to our celebrity guest, guys? Sure. Is there anything yeah. else? Yeah, celebrity. All right. Yeah. All right. So um, this week we have Philip Curry, founder of Astral Designs. Uh, now, right. formerly the founder of Lotus. Um, and let's see if we can get Philip on here. <clears throat> John, give while I'm doing this, give our viewers a little background on Philip. You've known Philip for a long time. I Philip Curry started Lotus Life Jackets sometime around the time we started IR, maybe a little earlier, maybe a couple years earlier, but not much. Um, and I met him first. The first time I met him was at River Sports teaching kayaking sometime in the mid '90s, maybe earlier. Mm-hmm. Hello. And then. Hey, what's up? Hey, Philip, you there? I'm here. Welcome to the Hammer so, Factor. Yeah, I'm telling your life story, Philip. You just want to give me a second here. Well, I'll uh, well, I'll let you, I'll let heard, you know if I need anything. I heard you. I heard you talking about the '90s. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so Philip drives up in like I guess you're driving like a Model <laughs> T or something, and uh, he had like a bunch of life jackets he was selling. He made himself. Do you remember that? That was at Riversport. I do Philip, remember that. Do you really? Yeah, of and, course. Uh, and uh, he wanted us to carry him in the store there. And uh, I can't remember what we said. I, I didn't really have any power over that decision at the time. But <laughs> did we sell him? Or did we tell you um, to get lost? Well, you're saying we. Well, to my father. You know. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember meeting him. And then yeah. I remember meeting, you know, this uh, 
you know, this other guy with shabby, shabby looking old dude named John Weld that like took yeah, me old up dude to uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. took me up to the um, to the crow's nest up there and showed me showed me some shorts you were working on. Yeah, I, thought that, I remember those. I remember that. Do you really? Huh? Of course, man. Yeah. Course. Cause what year did you start? What year did you start Astral? Astral? Yeah. Or not Astral Two. Lotus. I'm sorry. Um, 1994. Yeah. See, so you got us by a couple of years. We didn't really start Ernest like selling stuff to like 97, I think. So before, well, maybe you just showed me like the first roll of fabric you had or something. <laughs> I was making sure I was making sure it was like a home sewing machine probably back then, something like uh-huh. that. Right. But you started like you started the same way though. You were in your your basement, right? Or how'd you? I mean, how'd you start Lotus? Like, what was the impetus there? I did start it in a basement. Yes, I did. I was um, I was going to school at Warren Wilson, and um, I started it in my basement right there in Warren Wilson. No, not yeah. at Warren Wilson. Down the road from Warren Wilson. Um, yeah, I was. I, I hired a um, girl that was known for making costumes for the drama club or whatever at at college, and um, she. Stitched together a, um, a rescue jacket for me, and um, I think it was it was awesome. But yeah, that's that, that's where it started, right there in the basement. So, Philip, what off campus? What, when did you start paddling? Give me a little bit about uh, just when you how you got into paddling, where you started, and, and that kind of thing. Well, you know, I was. Um, in high school in Charlotte and um, uh, was working, shit, I don't know how I got into kayaking, but it was in 85 or 86. Um, I was 14 years old and um, <laughs> there was a um, there was a club and I joined it and, and um, I, uh, I learned to Kayak. I actually taught myself down in a um, down in a pond near my house, and um, took some took some trips with the uh, canoeists, Piedmont paddlers, canoe club. Killer. And uh, yeah, man, it just uh, went crazy. It went wild from there. And so what? So that's what 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 made you decide to to make a life jacket in the first place? When when did that come on your radar? So I was um, at some summer after I think ninety one or ninety two. Um, I was in college and took took a road trip out to uh, out west to paddle and um, paddled in Colorado. Made my way up to uh, Ketchum, Idaho, where I live now, actually. And um, and that's when I saw an HF jacket. Um, HF was a um, was a, a guy named Horst Fürstall that designed out of Germany, and he made these really beautiful, simple, durable uh, life jackets that were just 100% for kayakers. They were short-waisted and burly and uh, simple, and they looked good. It was just like, you know, primary colors, and um, I was just blown away by it. I was like, wow, that is a, a really cool piece of gear that uh, kind of a- amplifies the safety uh, or, or what you can do with a life jacket. You know, I was used to wearing extra sport life jackets, um, which kind of evolved out of the sailing industry. And, you know, they, they just didn't do what, a, what this rescue jacket uh, from Germany would do, kind of allow you to, to go help your friends uh, if stuff went sideways and um, and then I, my friend told me how much he paid for it. It was like $275. And, um, I mean, that was a big, big deal back then. I mean, life jackets normally were selling for 80 or whatever. So I was like, shit, man, I bet I could make that and sell it for 200 bucks, you know? And, um, and so that was really the, um, kind of the, 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 proverbial light that went off um and that's the moment 
that I, I, I got interested in it. Were you thinking business at the time or just like you're just going to make one and just that was maybe just going to be it? Um, you know, I was definitely old enough to uh, to be thinking about to be thinking about business. I was 21 or so and um, trying to figure out. I mean, I was at a liberal arts school, not really knowing where that was leading me. So um, I was um, and I knew I had to, you know, I mean, I've been working since I was. 14 years old. I enjoy working. And so I was like, well, you know, this is, this is my chance right here. You know, this is a, this is a little opportunity. And, um, yeah, it turned out well. It was a good, good thing. There was nobody so else you started, making. You started, you were in. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, there was no other, um, I mean, there was extra sport. Like I said, they, they were out of Miami. They were, they started in sailing world and then, Stolquist was um, way off the map in, in Colorado <laughs> back then. You know, um, Colorado was like an isolated little small paddling community, um, but Stolquist existed, and, and um, but it was really just just those two brands, and so it was easy to kind of do something that was unique and um, and special over in the East Coast where there was a lot more paddlers. That, that you know identified with the product and wanted to support it and and that was a time when paddling was and, really increasing in participation as well there was you know a lot of people your age and maybe a little younger but specifically you know early 20s were coming into the sport and it was really at the first time becoming a sport really i mean it wasn't really a sport before that um i don't know i mean um yeah, it, it, I guess it did start to gain in popularity around that time. Um, but I remember going to, you know, the Akoi or to the Gali, and it was, uh, you know, it was still a bit of a buzz over there. People, you know, people were pretty excited about it. And I mean, there was a, I don't know the numbers. I don't really follow them that much, but I, there was a pretty pretty good paddling community at that time. There was a lot of energy in kayaking. Yeah, you know, that's when the the rodeo the they had, you know, a U.S. rodeo team that was over on the Ocoee, and you know, slalom was big. Davy Hearn and um, John Lugbill and those guys were—they were hot shit, man. They were on the cover of like Wheaties, weren't they, John? Yeah, uh, Lugbill was, yeah. Lugbill, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Maybe that was kayaking's golden moment. It was '94? <laughs> you think that was it? That's the high water mark. <laughs> It could have been. <laughs> could have been, man. Like the RPM was probably like in full, full blown production in '94, yeah. right? That was probably so. the peak. I think so. I mean, like I, um, three shifts a day, three molds a day, making RPMs. And then you ended, up, a you ended up. With a bunch of people. What's that? What's that? No, you said That's you ended up with a bunch of people sewing for you in Weaverville. I remember coming down there and seeing you all down there. Um, yep. Sure did. Yeah, we um, so between ninety four and ninety eight, which was my last year with Lotus, um, we grew from just you know myself to um, about fifty fifty workers there at the factory. Right. They were all um, they were all from you know like local people, just mountain mountain folks that have been. Living and you know working in those um, in those factories up in that area, you know, forever. Yeah, it was right. pretty special. It was, it was a it was a cool experience. <laughs> and then uh, and then one day, Yvonne Chenard calls you and says, uh, "I I want a piece to that." Well, you know, there was there were plenty of other calls prior to um, to Patagonia. Um, contacted me. There were John. You remember there were um, kind of groups out of Atlanta, and, you know, maybe New York or Boston or somewhere that um, started to think that paddle sports was a big deal and an investment yeah. opportunity. So yeah. actually, you know, actually I got um, I got hit up by a few of those, and it was really easy to to really not respond. I was. Hell, I was 
whatever, 26, 25, 26 years old, having a good yeah. time. Um, <laughs> I, I can see Weld's mouth opening up on the video call here, just fantasizing about the, the VC dollars rolling in. No, well, we almost <laughs> came within a we came within a, a a hairs. I didn't realize how close it was until this summer. I talked to fully about this, but very close to getting acquired by Dagger slash Watermark. Uh huh. Um, but, Not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, that the was trigger, rampant. Though. But Patagonia was the one that that was like that's that's the, that's my peeps. I'm gonna make this happen. Well, well, yeah, yeah. They they really got my attention because um, yeah. I mean, who who better to you know to to entrust your brand with? Um, Absolutely. You know who 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 better to do that? And so. Certainly, they, but, they got my they got my ear, and yeah. you know it was a it was a pretty long negotiation actually. Um, it took about I don't know almost a year I think, and um, I pissed them off a few times. They walked away, and but they really wanted to to have a piece of um, to to get into the paddle sports arena. And, um, right, they, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently, apparently so. Uh, back then, I mean, back then it looked a lot different, you know. I mean, it was a different, different landscape for sure. Yeah, I guess so. But you made life jackets too, which has a much broader appeal than just paddle sports, you know. Yeah, I've never really gotten outside of paddle sports. I mean, sure, there are uh, other uses for life jackets, but other brands do that really well, like industrial and you know sailing, sailing. and whatnot no. so how did you piss him off philip what was going on there <laughs> well you know i <laughs> um they you know they they kind of when they came to me they were they had a um they kind of painted this picture where you know they were like wow we really admire what you guys are doing here we're gonna build a factory with like you know a grass roof for birds to nest and you know we're just gonna like invest in this but we're gonna be completely you know completely hands off and and let you guys run it and um i was running it with some friends really and i mean it was it was great it was going really well and um i was really into that i was thinking shit man you know be able to tap into some to some funds and you know some consulting or whatever and you know, kind of be a part of, of Patagonia. That'll be a really you know, neat. It'll be like a little independent, autonomous um, division of Patagonia. That was their original intention. And then over time, I think through um, maybe once they looked at the numbers and um, kind of some of the behind the scenes components of it, they were like, well, we're going to put our people in there and, um, you know, you're going to work for us. And I was like, well, you know, that, you know, screw off. That's not, you know, that's, that's just not how, what I want to do. I'm, I'm young and, you know, we're having a good time at this. And so they, they, they went away for a while and, um, and they came back and they just changed their story. They're like, well, we want all of it. And, you know, you can stay or you can go. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's in, that's what ended up happening is they essentially they made they made me an offer that it was really hard to uh, to walk away from. Um, so I took it and I took you know three years took three years off. They they they, they a, a part of the sale was to um, to be out of the market for three years. So I did that. I mean and three I years mean, those, to, almost to the minute. To the minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it was literally to the minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, that's, that's, that that was wonderful. Oh, sure, that's what I'm getting at, right? This is what I love to say, man. Because you, you, and like three other people that I could think of: Chan, Swanzig from Wavesport, uh, Joe Pulliam. You got out of Shawshank. You got out. <laughs> <laughs> and you came back in. You're like knocking at the gate three years later. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it seemed like you couldn't even get back in. You were well, like, I had some, I had some you were friends. like looking over the fence a couple months ago. <laughs> I, I had to come rescue you, John. You know, yeah. was a... <laughs> well, wait, I'm still here. <laughs> I hear you. I've been trying to hear you. Here. So then, so, so then, three wait, years to the day. 
But Passports yep. was so boring that you felt you had to come back in. I mean, did you feel like Patagonia wasn't? I mean, what was the? I mean, why? What? I mean, what was the thinking there? Well, there was a couple things. There was, um, you know, I took a couple years off and you know moved out west and um, really got into kind of moved away from paddling a bit and really got into like snowboarding and kind of high mountain living and um, really enjoyed that. And, and then I realized that um, situation out west is kind of weird with water and land and stuff and started to miss the East Coast and all the, um, you know, all the water and, and, um, and whatnot. So I moved back to Asheville and um, we bought a, a really sweet kind of farm. It was about 80 acres um, in southeast Buncombe County on the headwaters of the Rocky Broad. And, um, you know, I was super, super happy um, being, a, being a farmer. I had a dream I was going to, you know, just have this community supported agriculture farm. And, you know, we were just going to be really good at, you know, growing blueberries and you know, chickens and flowers yeah, right. or whatever. I came down there once. You guys are like in Black Mountain, right? And you guys had like this gigantic dog and like some dude living out in a shack somewhere, like kind of off, <laughs> off, off property. Yeah. <laughs> Who was that guy? That might that might have been Bakta. Yeah, that sounds right. It was kind of a cool scene, but it was definitely a scene. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a little bit of a commune out there. It was uh, <laughs> it was cool. It was those were good days, but. Um, you know, I was, I was watching, you know, what Patagonia was doing with Lotus and I was disappointed with uh, the fact that they were still, um, they were still doing some things environment. Like when I sold Lotus, I mean, my environmentalism goes way back to being a teenager and actually, you know, by, by, by listening to Patagonia and, and um, Yvonne Chouinard and, you know, um, being a member of, you know, some um, kind of radical environmental groups in high school and, and in college and stuff. And, um, and so I was disappointed that Patagonia didn't take some steps that, um, that I really thought they would and that they, they, they said they were going to. Specifically, the use of PVC was... Um, still in effect, and there was no uh, apparent, you know, movement away from it, and um, that bothered me. You know, I was just kind of bothered by that, irritated. Um, so I knew that there was some work to do there that could be done um, on the environmental side, and um, so that kind of gave me some a little bit of a little bit of fire to get back, and then. You know, when I was just kind of looking at being a farmer versus being, you know, getting back into the outdoor business, you know, I thought I could have a more of an impact by um, by getting back in the outdoor business. Um, but interestingly, I still, you know, I, I still yearn for farming. I, I, I love agriculture. And, you know, it's something that I, when I started astral i you know a mission statement says that you know over time i hope that um you know astral will be responsible for the clean the cleaning up of a lot of soil and and water that's related to to agriculture so you know that's kind of a long-term vision that that astral is kind of unfolding beginning to unfold now but um yeah we're in it in it for the long term and and really for the, a lot of it's for the environmental, you know, stuff that, that I can do with, with my career, you know, it's like kind of gives, gives a purpose to what we're doing. And so, and so Astral, Astral so really he, took off. I, you know, I had a chance to, to, to play with some of those super early PFDs and, mm -hmm. and, uh, obviously there was a progression to lighter, better fitting, some, a lot, a lot of innovation was going on there at Astral in a, in a pretty quick time. And then, mm -hmm. what was it, two years ago, the jump into footwear. Was that something, um, was that, something that you, ha you always had in the back of your head? What brought that on? Yeah, actually it was. I mean, 
I've always been a bit of a, um, you know, uh, I, I've always loved shoes. I mean, I, some, I mean, I remember sleeping with a pair of Nikes, um, back when I was like, you know, nine years old, like I've, I've always <laughs> really liked shoes, you know, huh. and, um, as a, as a, it's kind of weird, right. But, as a, um, <laughs> but as a paddler, we've seen, we've seen a lot of strange, um, trends in footwear. I mean, when I got into pack, into kayaking, everybody was wearing chucks, you know, within two or three years, um, everybody was wearing these freaking ridiculous, uh, plastic sandals, called augs you know and that was um in trend for a while and then you know it went to alps sandals um you know teva came in um eventually you know booties have always been there um and then keen with their you know strange shaped um you know shoes came in and and so it's always kayaking has always had this strange footwear um that's a part of it. And I always thought there was an opportunity there as a designer. I was like, I just always saw opportunity to do something uh, that was just more appealing um, to the eye, but, but, but had a good functionality that it has to have, you know, to be a good kayak and shoe. So yeah, um, the, the, the passion for, for shoes was there when I met a guy um, uh, he had been working for Solomon for seven years over in France. Uh, he's a fellow, you know, North Carolinian, um, came into my office and, you know, he was like, look, I think, you know, I could help you to do this. And really on that day, I, when I, I said, I was like, man, I fully agree with you. Um, that was back in 07, I think, or 08. Um, I said, I fully agree with you. And when I, you know, get, over the hump with these life jackets, you know, I would love to, uh, to collaborate. So in, um, I guess it was in 2009. Who was that? Philip? Is when, uh, Reglan Brewer. Okay. I, yeah. I knew that. So I just wanted our viewers to know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was around 2009 that Reglan and I really had that first real conversation about what astral footwear, you know, would look like and by, 2013 um you know we had our first shoe and it was it was called the brewer hell yeah and so it's yeah. you know building a life jacket is is pretty technical and mm -hmm. how does that cross over into building footwear is it uh is footwear less challenging more challenging what's give me give me the uh what's going yeah, on behind are, the scenes shoes are easy <laughs> Any fool can make a shoe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, they're um, they're really not that far apart. You know, life jackets. Um, basically, you're you're taking a fabric and foam, um, you know, concoction, and you're and you're anchoring it to a bony part of your body. Are you guys there? Yeah, we're here. Mm -hmm. Oh hell, that's Doc Christy trying to. Ch chime in um mm. we can bring um, her on if you want <laughs> no nah, she's she's trying to talk budget or something so um that could be fun <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway so basically anchoring a fabric and foam to your body you know in a way that that fits and um and, and performs um Basically, just applying that same type of analysis to the foot um, was not that big of a um, of a jump, really. Yeah, but you got to see. The, for, for me, though, who has some experience in manufacturing, like I look at that, I'm like, you got to glue something. You know what I mean? And as soon as you start gluing anything, it's 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 an issue. You know what I mean? Well, it's a gigantic, well, you know, technical, it, complicated it, issue. You well, know? and I think that um, that kind of Alludes to one of my one of my original design intentions, which was I didn't want to glue anything. I told Reglan, I was like, "Dude, we're not going to use glue." He's like, "Fuck off, we can't do that." I was like, "No, <laughs> we, we got to stitch it. Uh, we got to stitch it together." And um, so, you know, our first shoes. If I showed you our prototypes, they were completely stitched. The rubber was stitched, you know, to the uh, you know to the upper and um, 
they were they were pretty crazy looking actually. But um, now you know, over time, we've we're doing more gluing. Um, but I think you know, stitching. Any, anyway, I agree with you, John, that uh, gluing gluing sucks, and um, I, I always try to re- to reduce the the amount of glue that that, that we use in shoes. Where were we? So you start up, you start up Astral and, you know, when you had Lotus, you, you know, Lotus in some ways looked like IR, you know, we had a crusoers at our place too. Mm-hmm. Um, and while you were out, we started moving stuff offshore actually with the help of a, a quaint, mutual acquaintance of ours, Bob holding, he, uh, got us into the Patagonia factory or one of the Patagonia mm-hmm. factories where in fact they were making Lotus paddle sports gear. So while you were, while you were taking your uh, sabbatical, right. I was watching that stuff get made. It was kind of crazy to see that. But um, we started outsourcing stuff at that point, mostly for, you know, we just couldn't keep up with production. And, you know, it's, it's tough to run a sewing factory, as you know, um, and do something else at the same time. Right, um, right. You know, I mean, there's a myriad of issues. But you start outsourcing production. Um, that's, a big, that's a big learning curve. I mean, did you find it as challenging as, as we did? And what made you think you're going to do it overseas rather than do it back in Weaverville? Well, you know, Astral was, um, um, we were making all of our life jackets in, in Asheville um, until it became impossible, actually, to, to make money, um, to, to survive. Um, I mean, we really gave it our best, our best shot. And, you know, there was just a limit to what consumers are willing to pay, um, for a life jacket, you know, when Stolquist and Kokatad and, um, you know, Extra Sport or MTI, when everybody's making their jackets overseas and you're the only guy, you know, paying U.S. wages, uh, we just couldn't couldn't make it happen so there was just it was a survival uh, move that 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 took us there actually and um you know i i wasn't happy with it i um um and and i actually kind of left with with the factory i i moved in 2009 i guess we made that decision to to move our pfd manufacturing uh, to Asia in, I don't know, 2007, I think. And by 2009, um, I went there. I moved, I moved over to Asia with my family. And, you know, the reason for that was to, was to be near the factory and, and really understand and see, um, but you know, how, how our stuff is made and certain things are done. And, um, so that's how I approached it. Very, very hands-on. I wasn't willing to just, you know, have an agent handle it. Yeah. Um, which is which is what most people do. Very interesting. So you you decided to take your operation and have your finger on the entire production process over there. Yep. And, yep. And were you in the factory every day? Was the factory doing runs of the PFDs, and then there would be a period to where nothing was being produced, or were you literally going five days a week into the factory? Well, you know, the PFD factory is a little different. It's up in it's up in China, and they um, they really have um, a great system, and it and it was easy for me to see that those that factory was better than any factory that I could run, um, in America. I mean, it was really very well run. Um, and, um, it allowed me actually to focus on the development of, of, uh, shoes of the footwear side of the business. Uh, I really entrusted that factory in China to do it. And they're still our partner and they're amazing. Um, you know, they can build life jackets, um, much better, actually, than we could in, in Asheville, just to be frank. Um, <clears throat> um, and then the footwear, but the footwear thing, yeah, for for the last, from the beginning, I've been involved every step of the way with that. And, and where are the shoes to the made? Point of, shoes are made in, in Vietnam. Okay. And um, just outside of Ho Chi Minh City. 
And, um, you know, up until you know, seven or eight months ago, I was there, um, you know, most of the, most of the year. And, um, yeah, I was in the factory all the time. We have an office in the factory and so fully, fully integrated into it, which is important. Important. So what's, for so what's, what's the strategy for, uh, this new administration in terms of imports and, and that kind of thing? And what are you, what are you thinking or anything at all? Are you just sort of waiting and seeing what's going to go down? <laughs> <laughs> this is a personal question for Come me on, too. Let's hear, <laughs> let's hear it from both you guys. I'm super interested in this. I mean, I, um, I I'm kind of assuming status quo on that. Um, John, I, um, I don't see. I mean, I, I would seriously doubt that. Uh, that administration is going to shut down or, you know, so heavily in, uh, tax imports from Vietnam or China on shoes and life jackets that um, it would um, force us to, 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 to come back. Um, I wouldn't mind um, if it happens. Um, I'm not saying that it would be a terrible thing. Um, I really enjoy making stuff in America um, a piece of that is Americans being willing to pay the price to pay Americans uh, to do the work. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of the the root of the of the issue, um, and probably the reason that those those things can't come back here is because it's been proven that Americans aren't willing to pay um, Americans to to make stuff for them anymore. What, what so, do you think, Mr. Weld? I guess it's a similar similar sentiment. I mean, for us, it's not so much money. You know, it's not a fi financial issue. I mean, Cocotat is you know makes dry suits in California, um, and for us, you know, major like you look at a thousand dollar dry suit, a huge portion of that is the materials. You know, the labor is certainly part of it, but. You know, I mean, the thing for us is that, you know, we make shorts, we make rash guards, we make, you know, neoprene stuff, spray skirts, we make dry tops, we make dry suits. You need a production line for each one of those, a certain set of machines. And, you know, it's not really reasonable for us to own a million dollars worth of machinery and have 80 people come in and run that production line for a couple of weeks and then lay them off. You know what I mean? Um, what you do is you, you send that production out to somebody who makes rash cards. You send that production out to somebody who makes you know, jackets, you know, it's called contract sewing. That's the business we're in. Um, but there's no contract sewing in the U S you know what I mean? I'd love for stuff to come back to the States. I don't think it would be a huge increase in price at all for us, at least for a lot of the products we make, but there's no, there's no one here who does it, you know? And paddle sports um, can't support that. You know, there'd have to be many, many well, industries come on board before you could get that. Well, I think we, we'd find a jacket. We find a, a factory that makes rainwear in the United States, for instance, and piggyback on them and make, make dry tops there. You know what I mean? That'd work out fine for us, but there's just no one here to do it. I don't think, I think Philip's right. I don't think, I can't conceive of how that's going to change because there's not a person in this country who, who can't reach out and touch something that wasn't made overseas, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, well, but I don't know. I met you with Philip because in some ways we're in the same – we have a similar trajectory in terms of production and stuff like that, where we came from. Um, mm -hmm. And it's always a, a bit of a sore subject for me because I, I think Philip – I don't know, Philip, you can correct me on this, but I feel like we get villainized sometimes for the decisions we made, um, which are by and large completely out of our control. You, you know what I mean? They have really nothing to do with us. You know, We're just playing by the rules set out before us. You know, um, I mean, Philip, do you think I have that – Am I misinterpreting your situation? Um, yeah, I don't feel uh, villainized. No, I've never felt villainized. Um, I don't think villainized is the right word, but I do get people who, who, who criticize us for not making stuff domestic, or they'll call us and be like, where's your stuff made? And if I tell them it's overseas, that's the, kind of the end of the phone call. Right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I guess I'm in a situation where there's, you know, there are no manufacturers that are domestic in life jackets <laughs> and um, in footwear, <clears throat> you know, they're very, very, I mean, I don't know of any, I, I mean, I know that New Balance claims, I mean, I think 20% of their production is, some of it's done in the, in the U.S. 
Keen, I think, uh, makes some claims to uh, make, or they do uh, make some product in Portland, but it's more work boot kind of product, I think. Um, but you know, I do like the challenge. I would, um, um, I would love to manufacture something again in the U.S. And it, would it pushes, you? I mean, would you? In your mind, would you run the factory? Or would you send that that work out to somebody else who's already making a similar product? Well, I would want Astral. I would want Astral to do it. I wouldn't contract it out because I don't. We can't afford that layer of, you know, um, right. that paying that extra middle, you yeah. know, middleman uh, to do it. I don't think so. Um, we would have to do it ourselves. But it, it, you know, it forces you as as a designer to, you know, to build some to design something that is, you know, doesn't require much, um, you know. Labor is such a high high factor in America. The cost of labor is so high that you know you can design a shoe or a life jacket that doesn't require much labor. Um, right. You know, then you know it's possible, but you also kind of kill the the point of doing it in America, which is to you know give you know your fellow Americans jobs and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's well, kind of a catch twenty two. Well, I've certainly enjoyed uh, seeing the progression of Astral, and it's an awesome story that you've got uh, with Lotus. And I want to hear where where you see the footwear business going. I noticed that you've uh, just launched a a uh, more trail running oriented um, shoe. But before I get into that, there was this life jacket. It was a prototype a long time ago, and it had this strapping system where you pulled on the strap and it was basically one strap that weaved and wrapped around the whole jacket. And it was, it seemed awesome. Whatever happened to that concept? Do you know what I'm talking about? I have one of those. I have one of those. It's a blue one in my basement. I still got it too. It's killer. Yeah. Yeah, um, Johnson, Johnson, um, shut that down. That jacket, uh, Johnson infringed show. on a Excellent. yeah oh, <laughs> yeah oh, 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 oh. um apparently um, <laughs> Eric Johnson <laughs> I'm like what <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was um uh, there was a claim from from their side that that jacket infringed on a patent that they had and um I was advised you know originally that there was actually you know absolutely no uh, problem with our design and then when um when they pushed the case you know it just turned out that uh that their lawyers were really really good and and that was kind of the first and only time i've ever had to deal with something like that right but um yeah the net result was that um we had to discontinue the you know the the use of that design well i got and, one uh, the, i mean <laughs> Yeah, you've got one. That's cool. I know, I'm going to yeah, eBay that thing now. <laughs> yeah, it was called the Z-strap. Yeah, the Z-strap. That's, that's right. That's right. The Z-strap. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it worked. It worked really well. Um, anyway, I don't want to talk too much about that. So anyway, Astro Footwear, new running shoe. Tell us uh, what's going on. What's What, what are we looking Well, at? it's not a running shoe. It's not at all a running shoe. It looks like a bit like a running shoe. It's got some inspiration from that, but it's a, it's a walking shoe. I mean, it's a... Uh, we call them trail shoes. It's it's really a light hiker, you know. Um, you know the, the the reason that we did that is because um, you know we realized like our first focus was shoes that work really well down in the gorge, like in the bottom of the river and you know on the rocks and the and the bank um, in the river, and and then we realized shit man like these trails in and out of these places are sometimes you know brutal treacherous you know um it you know we need a better shoe for the the path between the river and our car and so um we've just evolved into trail shoes um and that's what you see that's what you see there is uh, some really some really good trail shoes and the interesting thing is they evolved from the river kind of um a lot of the trail shoes on the market have started in mountaineering you know um started with leather heavy leather boots for mountaineering and stuff and <clears throat> and then they kind of get ground down 
you know, down to a lighter and lighter uh, shoe that you see today. But for us, you know, we came from the river and and and, and made a trail shoe, and it's we have a, a interest, a different approach because of that. I think, you know, grip and balance and all that stuff. So. so- so how are you capitalizing on the booming SUP market? Have you staked your 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 ground there yet, or what's the strategy? I don't know. I, that's uh, you know, I, I I consult with you about that. <laughs> you don't want to consult with me on that. <laughs> well, is sure that Whitewater SUP is the next big thing. So. <laughs> well, it is for me. I I, I actually really enjoy it. Me too. I, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I, I avoided it um, until last summer, and and um, last summer I loved it. I mean, it was like that's because you, know, you hate a, kayaking. Well, I mean, I don't hate kayaking. I'm just scared of, scared to kayak. So um, we, we should go on an SUP trip up to Confluence, Philip. See if right. we can get weld out. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. Loop. Well, you guys should come out, um, come out here this summer. It's going to be huge. Oh man, yeah. it's going to be huge. Oh man, Philip, I'll... I know, uh, I know. John Weld's favorite conversation is anything that starts with "Hey, you know what you guys should make." Mm. <laughs> so a skirt. <laughs> so a skirt in... with a rope pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in a similar spirit, I got a question for you or an idea to pitch you. Okay. Here we go. Cool. Have you seen uh, <laughs> big wave surfing now? These guys, a lot of these guys have these uh, like rapid inflation life jackets. They like pull a little rip cord, and it goes from like nothing to the size of like a normal life jacket. Yep. You know, I know that same technology or something similar is out there for avalanche airbags. Um. What do you think about having something like that incorporated into normal white water life jackets so you could like double or triple the flotation that you had for kind of like a flush drowning scenario? Like something like, you know, like a life jacket that you would have just for like high water north fork of the payette or yeah. Steam or something like that. Obviously it'd be like super, super small market, but it seems like the technology already exists and it could definitely be a lifesaver in the right circumstances. There you go. Have totally. To- yeah, man, it's um, um, it's a pretty obvious need. Uh, it's a, it'd be a great product. It actually, um, actually, we created it back in two thousand and seven, um, and it was a jacket that we call the hybrid, and um, <clears throat> we tried to make them in the states and and couldn't. So um, actually, we have a anyway. Um, we have something coming for you. That's uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are you going to pay Lewis a commission on that, or how's that going to work out? <laughs> Philip, you yeah, have but it's um, <laughs> it's something that um, yeah, it's I, I'm I'm really excited about it because it makes so much sense. The versatility of of that product is is amazing, and uh, there's a, definitely a need for it. I mean, I was listening to. Can you have um, a lower you, than standard flotation in that jacket? Uh, and still pass Coast Guard approval if it if it has the potential to inflate to Coast Guard levels. See, that's buoyancy. the thing. That's the thing. You can. There's a um, and we have approval. We already have the jacket approved. It's um, it's got eight pounds of buoyancy by foam, and that's mm-hmm. half of um, like a normal, you know, a foam filled life jacket, which is fifteen right. and a half or sixteen. So it's um, the what they call inherently buoyant. A component, the foam component has to be eight pounds. And then, um, so ours is uh, eight pounds of foam, and the inflatable component adds about 15 pounds. Oh, super cool. So, yeah. So, would you so say that eight. we had a scoop on this product? Would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have a knack for pitching products that already exist. <laughs> I, like, I had the logic one day, and I, I told Jane about this boat that I was like, I had like this like fantasy or this kayak that I wanted, 
and Shane just kind of like he's kind of like smirking at me and he's like all right come in the back and he like shows me the plug for the brap <laughs> like, like awesome nice. for guys <laughs> so Philip Curry you go back you go back 15 years let's say to when you're just between Lotus and Astral you could do you could tell one piece of advice or change something what what would it be oh jeez hot C. Uh, um, I'm not gonna ask you what your favorite number is I'll spare you that one um, 15 years ago, one bit of advice, um, Jesus, John, <laughs> hot seat, hot seat, hot seat. I mean, that's like, look, that's, that's looking back, man. I don't do that very often. Um, I don't know, like make sure that, you know, keep oil in your tractor. <laughs> <laughs> <Hi. laughs> Well, we're kind of running out of time here, Philip. When are we going to see Astral Farms pop up? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. We have a, um, we have a shoe now that's made from hemp. Um, so that's uh, huge for us. I'm so excited. Yeah, so we, we're making a shoe out of hemp. It's well, do you have any awesome. hemp products in the pipeline? You can make salmon. And, well, Phil, Phil Curry and I are going to announce a, a joint product, I think, at some point here. That I've, been, I've been pestering about for years. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. But I'm not sure if I'm ready to release it yet. Well, and I'm working on one with Brent Toper also. Brent Toper? Yes. Really? I could only imagine what that might be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Wait for it. <laughs> I'm, I, I can't wait. Is this something going to release it out to a retailer? Or? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Another venue of sorts. <laughs> Okay, guys, we got to move on. All right, here. boys, hang on, All Philip. Right. Hang on, Philip. You're 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 in on this last little bit. We got a. Uh, this is kind of our everybody's favorite uh, part of the show here. We do some rants and raves. Um, so you can either pick a rant, something you want to uh, rant on, or something that you're totally into and want to rave about. Philip, anything pop pop in your head? Well, I really like this um, Grace and Weld show. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the. Uh, <laughs> Sort of the tough guy, sweet guy approach. I got an email. Good cop, bad cop. I got an email. It was like, quit being a dick and talk to us. <laughs> and that was from Mr. Weld. And then like two, two or three days later, I get you know, one from Mr. Grace that says... He didn't really mean that. <laughs> Would you please talk to us? I thought that was pretty awesome. I really like. I, I really like the Grace and Weld show. I think you should change yeah. the name to that. Right. Well, we got Geltman on here, and he seems to be getting all the viewer mail recently. So <laughs> nice. Right. Uh, Weld. No, this Lewis, is cool. Thanks, guys. Legal. Hang on, you're not off yet, Philip. Weld, Lewis, you got any uh, rants, raves? God, I had a rant. Um. Shoot, I don't know. Geltman, what do you got? I can't even prepare prepared this week. Um, yeah, I'm pretty unprepared also, Nothing. but as right. usual. Well, but I got a, I got a rave. Say, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I can say. always give you the impromptu rave, which is uh, the New Yorker. I'm like, I'm over talking about kayaking. I don't know why we do this any, every week. I don't know if anybody really listens or not. I, I can't believe that everybody's not sick of talking about kayaking. <laughs> But the New Yorker, man, it's like my little, like, dose of culture here in the Columbia River Gorge. There's nothing in there about kayaking. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right, to the Check it out. I think we're the only nice. two people who listen to the show. The <laughs> John, John, you're a smart yeah. guy out of the, um, out of the, out of the Capitol. And I'm, I'm curious, um, what is the, the best source for news these days? I, mean, I read. Uh, I read every morning. I read the New York Times and I read the Wall Street Journal, and then I also subscribe to Tegan Goddard's uh, Political Wire, and then I read Chris Zilla's blog, this guy from the Washington Post, and then I read uh, Politico. Oh, okay. really? I just scan through it. Sounds good. I, I, I could rant about Chris Zilla, but I won't. <laughs> Cool. I, I, you take him for what he is. You have to take him in with everybody else. I'm pretty involved, though. 
I can't get enough of it. My my favorite podcast these days, besides the obvious, of course, is uh, uh, Tony Kornheiser show. Do you guys remember Tony Kornheiser? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I've listened to some My Tony dad Kornheiser. loves that. And uh, Saliz is on Tony Kornheiser's podcast, and like he is just like, you know, he'll get these like obvious softball policy questions, or just sort of about you know what's going on in the world, and he is like incapable of having the most basic substantive conversation about anything that's going on in the world. All he knows about is like the political horse race, and it's like <laughs> right. to me, it's like the absolute epitome of like the worst of political journalism it drives me nuts yeah. but anyway i'm sure that's gonna be super relevant for a lot of people listening to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right boys philip thank you so much for coming on the show looking yeah, forward man. to see uh yeah. all right thanks Philip. see what astro has and uh we'll call that a wrap thanks lewis thanks john and we will see you next week remember to subscribe to our podcast send us a viewer mail if you like us and thanks for listening